Imagine what it's going to be like when I stop talking. So. <laughs> okay, start with the telephone. Yeah, yeah, start with the telephone. Are you ready? Sorry. Ready. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the April edition of Forest Country Gardening. My name is Elaine Cameron, Ma Angelina County Master Gardener. Today, we are at the fruit. I need to start over. <laughs> <laughs> it's cutting off, and I'm Sorry. Going blah, blah, blah. I'm going to try again. There we go. Ready. Hello everyone. Welcome to the April edition of Forest Country Gardening. My name is Elaine Cameron, Angelina County Master Gardener. Today we are at the Fruit and Vegetable Conference and broadcasting live from Pitzer Garrison Convention Center. Our guest today is Mr. Greg Grant, who is currently the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Agent for Horticulture in Smith County. Greg is an award-winning horticulturist, writer, conservationist, and a seventh-generation Texan. Wow. He introduced many successful plants to the nursery trade, including Dwarf Pink, Katie Ruelia, Gold Star Esperanza, Laura Bush Petunia, John Fanny Clocks, Pam's Pink Honeysuckle, Henry and Augusta Newberg Sages, Big Mama and Pam's Pink Turk's Cap. Greg writes for the Texas Gardener and has authored several books. I'm not exaggerating when I say Greg Grant is a Texas treasure. Welcome, Greg. Okay, maybe a little exaggeration. A little exaggeration? But since I wrote that, it's okay. So. Okay, so see, there you go. <laughs> Came back to haunt you, didn't it? So, Greg, we're talking about native plants today. April, everybody is admiring all the wildflowers, the roadside. We have lovely You wouldn't wildflowers. be a Texan if you didn't, so. Well, that is That's true. That's right. And East Texas has its share of great wildflowers. Absolutely. We all think about Central Texas for, for wildflowers and natural beauty, but we have just as much here. It's just different things that a lot of people don't, don't know and, and right. sometimes underappreciate because we have so many beautiful things here. I think we're underrated. As we're very we're very underrated to uh, uh, Central Texas. They get all the credit, and that's the wildflowers that everybody knows their name. Right. But we have even more wildflowers and more species, name. and people just don't know them, and so we don't get get credit for it. And we should. Right, right. So it's a time of year when people think about native plants, and people think about native plants when they see the wildflowers. But native plants are a lot more than that. Absolutely, and plants in general are more than that. We tend to think about. You know, garden flowers and we have you know certain groups that are in the know that talk about the wildflowers and we have the people that are interested in pollinators and so uh, what I'm trying to get people to do is look at the really big picture when it comes to plants kind of start from from there I mean we wouldn't live on this planet if it wasn't covered with plants and for millions of years it was native native plants that's all we had so people are, are newcomers to this and so all the things we think of uh, about spring gardens like azaleas and camellias. Those have only been here for a blip in time. We've had this whole network of plants and animals and, and species and insects that have all lived harmoniously until we got into the, to the mix. And so now that things are kind of starting to go uh, amuck, it's time to, to reevaluate, you know, what plants we should be growing and how mm -hmm. every single plant, no matter whether you think it's pretty or not, is important uh, to the ecosystem in our lives. I mean, mm -hmm. People don't understand that, uh, I mean, we think about oxygen, but we don't think about clothes, gasoline, every amount of energy in our body to do anything we do. I and mean, plants are the only thing that can take energy from the sun and turn it into something usable. And so we think of plants as something garden clubbers do or crazy master gardeners like you do or, or a native plant enthusiast. It's the reason we're alive. I mean, That's our correct. existence. So it's not a foo foo thing for somebody who just likes to look at something pretty. It's the reason we live and breathe and eat and move. And so we need everybody to appreciate plants in general. And the majority of the plants out there are native plants that were here before we got here. And so we need to treasure those because we can't live with just gardens. Uh, and of course, True. even if we could, bees, birds, butterflies, all the amazing things in nature wouldn't live. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's well known in science that you can't just start removing pieces of the puzzle and have it all stay, stay together. And so uh, it's, it's a good time to preach about native plants because wild, wildflowers are blooming up and down the roadside. Red buds are starting to bloom. Dogwoods will be blooming soon. Carolina jasmine's blooming. And so people are ripe for, for education. So educate away. So. There you go. Well, and you had an excellent article in the January, February issue of Texas Gardener on that very topic about how plants oh, good. are central to our lives. And uh, by the time an article comes out, I've already written something else. So I, and I don't read what I write, and so I've forgotten <laughs> about that. But it, but it's true, and I yeah. uh, I try to preach that a lot, and uh, everybody needs to listen. I mean, people that you know, 50% of the world gardens, 50% of 
doesn't, but that doesn't mean plants are getting less important to those 50% that don't garden, so they need to know it too. And I think we should train children by the time they can learn about the value of plants, not wait till they get old enough to see if they want to join the garden club, That's a right. decision about plants or become a master gardener. In, in today's That's case, maybe, because then you, it, it's kind of too late. I mean, we can teach them to, to make a flower bed or to, you know, adopt their favorite butterfly, but uh, we need to teach them it's their existence that depends on yeah. plants, it's every more, plant, not, more just, than your, leisure not time. just your favorite plants. So. Right, right. Yeah, and people, I think people despise what is common. Is that not a common thing? Yeah, that's an age-old thing, and that's, uh, that's one reason so many of our, our landscape plants are from Asia. There's two reasons. Uh, first of all, you don't value things that you see on the roadside mm -hmm. or the ditch, or even the bad side of town for that matter. Uh, and so if it's rare, we tend to think of it as, as more valuable. It came from someplace else, mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I'd say 75, maybe 85% of our, our landscape plants here in East Texas, we're talking about azaleas, camellias, gardenias, sweet olives, banana shrubs, uh, daylilies, Asian jasmine, red tip, fortinias, Indian hawthorns, I mean, crepe myrtles, those are all from, from China and Japan. And uh, part of it's because their garden culture is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years older than ours, so their plants are more developed. But also it's just because we see something that we don't have and we want it. And you see something we do have, uh, we don't want it. And I used to make my, my plant buddies really mad. And I've been a plant collector all my life. And uh -huh. I'd say, you know, if a plant's rare, it's either because it's ugly or it won't grow. And they're like, what? And it's <laughs> kind of based on human nature because uh -huh. we always want things that are, uh, that are rare and we don't have. But a lot of times, if you don't have it, there's a reason. That. So uh, if we could grow it and it's pretty, a lot of people would have it. And so we devalue those things that are growing up down the roadside because they know how to grow themselves. But yet the whole system on this planet is based on plants that know how to grow themselves. Uh, I've tried to garden way too much my entire life and you know nine surgeries later now I can barely look after my own garden so we can't cultivate uh, gardens for an entire planet so we have to have some self-sustaining uh, landscape for earth mm -hmm. uh, for us to, to be happy in addition to our flower beds and our master gardener projects and that sort of thing and so that's the part we're severely lacking on right now is uh, people knowing how to you know, heal the uh, natural environment and, uh, and let it do its thing and so we it can't all be a cultivated field or a pasture or right. a forest or a right. flower bed because, uh, one, it doesn't take the place of nature, and two, you can't cultivate the, mm -hmm. the whole planet. I mean, the, the resources that it takes are, are impossible. True, true. Yeah, and, it, and a good principle in gardening is don't fight nature. I mean, if a plant doesn't want to grow here, oh, and don't see, grow it. When I grew up in Longview, first of all, I'd never traveled around, so I thought we were the only place that had dogwoods and azaleas and camellias mm -hmm. and stuff until mm -hmm. I took a band trip to Georgia. And, high school and realized we were just a little blip of the southeast because mm -hmm. the rest of Texas didn't have that. Uh -huh. But at the same time, I was with the plants. I wanted I wanted a cactus and rock garden. And so right. if you live in a forest, you want a rock garden. If you live in the desert, you want an azalea garden or, or a water garden. I mean, Dallas and San Antonio, they want to grow camellias and azaleas. And so uh -huh. and you have to build raised beds. And you have to bring in soil and stuff. That's the wrong way to do it. And I can tell you, you will lose to your environment and so you pick what grows where you are if you live in the forest make a forested landscape if you live in a prairie make a prairie landscape if you live in a bog there are amazing plants that grow where it's wet and muddy so that's in a lifetime of gardening i learned that that lesson take what you have and you can embellish that but don't fight it because it's just way too much trouble and plus you'll lose uh, right. you will wear out before the, the landscape you're trying to change wears out because it wants to just keep going back to what it what it was well that's true so why tell our viewers why we should plant native plants anyway several really good reasons and of course uh, from a gardening standpoint a plant that's been here for thousands or sometimes even millions of years prime example next week he's fixing to drop down into the 20s and everybody's all excited right. about uh, so my master gardener class yesterday like what plants are you going to cover when I, said, I won't be covering a single thing <laughs> one because i've gardened my whole life and right. i'll put things out that you know, it's not even March 15th, so it's supposed to be freezing now. So you people that already have tomatoes out, you deserve to lose them because you planted them at the wrong time. And then I said, plus, uh, I use lots of old-fashioned plants that have been around for hundreds of years, and I'm surrounded by nature that's been around for thousands and millions of years, and you don't think those plants have seen a, a, you know, a late frost before or a <laughs> drought or a flood. And so, so one reason native plants are good is, is they, uh, they're uniquely adapted to wherever you live. Uh, so whether it be West Texas and... and dry conditions or central Texas and alkaline conditions or east Texas and, and high rainfall. I mean, those plants have been through those uh, cycles and so tend to be lower maintenance. That doesn't mean no maintenance, but they tend to be more adapted right. to soil conditions, 
uh, to rainfall conditions, and that's a goal of mine. Everybody should learn to plant. I don't care whether you live in El Paso when you get eight inches of rain or Beaumont where you get 60. You should plant plants that can survive on the rainfall alone in your area. There's no reason to put in high water use plants in the desert. And there's no reason for us to have to build a raised bed here to grow a real drought loving plant. And there's so many plants that like what you have. And instead of searching the world for those plants, the first place to look is right outside the window because every plant is native here. Uh, grew up with those same conditions. It not just grew up, evolved over over thousands of years. And so lower maintenance, better adaptation, um, tend to have fewer problems with insects and diseases, but not no problems because insects and disease are just as much a part of, of nature uh, as a healthy plant. So in the nature, a dead plant is equally as important as a live plant. An ugly flower is just as important oh, as a pretty flower. Okay. Uh, moth is just as important as a butterfly. A, uh, crow was just as important as, as a bluebird. It's, we forget about that. In nature, they're all exactly equal. In horticulture, we think, this is pretty, I like it. This is ugly, I don't. This is rare, I like it. This is common, I don't. That's not the way nature works. And so once you back off and become sort of used to that system and realize things are important, plants are, you know, every plant's going to die. You and I are going to die, so we don't get overly excited about it. We just put something new, you know, we cultivate things the best we, we can. And when there's some powdery mildew on a dogwood or when there's aphids on a new growth of a shrub. I mean, people don't realize, like, uh, titmice, uh, chickadees are a good example. Uh, they take moss off of trees and make their nest out of it. But yet people say, oh my gosh, where do I've got moss growing on my tree. Um, hummingbirds take spider webs. My wife deathly afraid of spider webs. <laughs> hummingbirds eat things like aphids. They take their nest, they take lichen off the bark of unhealthy trees. They sew it together with spider webs. That's what they make their, their cool. nest out of. Uh, brown headed nuthatches make their nest out of pine needles that fall off a pine tree and they take the wings off pine seeds and make their nest out of them. So all of our native birds, animals, frogs, lizards, butterflies, moths are dependent on every single plant that's neighbor, not just the ones we like, every single one, mm -hmm. from uh, poison ivy that bluebirds eat the fruit on, uh, to bull thistles that my dad used to pay us $5 a piece to grub out. Well, they're the, the host plant for the painted lady butterfly. They're the nectar plant for swallowtail butterflies. And so uh, you have to realize that every single thing in nature depends on every single, not just some of them, the right. whole suite of native plants that was here before we got here. Unfortunately, a lot of those plants are disappearing, habitats change, you know, uh, Bermuda grass pastures weren't native here, uh, loblolly forests weren't native here, so we've changed all the environment and the animals and the wildlife and the birds and the pollinators have all changed with it. And then the problem is you start losing those things and th things get disrupted and we've introduced invasive plants and so it's, it's very different from what it used to be and it gets kind of scary because uh, we've had several massive uh, extinctions throughout our Earth's history. Dinosaurs for a prime example. Well, there's some of the scientists that say that we're going through another mass extinction now, and you think, oh, so what? We well, lose a butterfly, or I didn't like that bird anyway, or who needed a um, ivory-billed woodpecker? Well, of course, we're, less, we're a species too, and so, you know, that uh, climate change is all in, in the news right now, where every inch of Texas used to be at the bottom of the ocean, so I'm pretty sure it's hard to breathe at the bottom of the ocean and hard to garden there too. So, you know, we don't need major uh, climatic changes, whether we're responsible for them or not, because we are one of those things that can, can be extinct. And so the best thing to do is take a proven system, which the earth has been proven for millions of years, and instead of trying to reinvent something that oftentimes doesn't work when man comes up with a brilliant idea like levee in the river or drain in the swamp, you know, all the things that we thought were good ideas were bad ideas. So we had a proven system here and it would behoove us to stick to that because uh, we know it works. Uh, it worked before we got here, it worked when we got here, and if we're smart, we can make it work a long time while we're still here. So native plants are part of that entire mix um, from pollinators to birds to wildlife and then all the standard things in horticulture. Um, they keep us cooler, they clean the water, they clean the air, they do away with pollution, they produce oxygen. Uh, I mean, so all the standard benefits of any other plant come in, a, in plants that are easier to grow, that, that are more adapted and longer lived here. So why wouldn't you choose those? Right, good point. Yeah, we had Dr. Tallamy, who's an entomologist at University of Delaware, came up with research a number of years ago, which found that insects only eat, have the digestive ability to digest native plants. And they, that plants from other places are virtually useless to them. Yeah, people don't think about that, that you know, I love birds, and some of my favorites are a, 
uh, bluebirds and woodpeckers and brown-headed nuthatches, but this goes for all birds, if you think about it. And bluebirds are a good example. I've got 100 nest boxes at home. Bluebirds, for their entire existence, every cell in their body, every cell in the baby bluebird from the time the egg hatches is made out of native plants that they evolved with for thousands, millions of years. And so if you start changing that, I mean, everybody knows what a healthy diet is, even though a lot of us don't stick to it. Now, there's a prime example. What happens when we all start eating unhealthy diets and refined foods and too much fat and sugar all the time? It fouls us up. We're getting diabetes and overweight and heart attacks and all that sort of stuff. Well, the same thing basically happens uh, to wildlife. And just because a bird eats a Chinese privet uh, berry or a Chinese tallow seed, that doesn't mean that that's good for them or that they're going to exist on that. And so now there's coming up with the science to back that up and it, it makes perfectly good sense if that's what you ate forever and people understand this in grazing my brother's a veterinarian cows and horses you got that but we forget about basic things like you know, birds and frogs right. and toads and snakes and lizards and butterflies and bees everybody's all excited about uh, of course you know, i love honey and honeybees are cool but that that's a non-native beater oh, 400 native bee species in texas and most people can't name the first one of them and so all those things are critical to, to pollination and plants. And of course, if you didn't have insects, you wouldn't have birds. If you didn't have birds, you wouldn't have spread the seed. So there's this whole cycle that takes place with insects and birds and protecting the plant, but also spreading the plant. But then those trees are supposed to at some point die and then your woodpeckers come in and your secondary cavity dwellers. So it's this real interconnected web that we always, we either ignored or so oversimplified that we just fouled it up tremendously. And now luckily there are a few scientists like Dr. Talony that are, that are going there and figuring out the nuts and bolts. And it's uh, it makes really good sense, but when he goes around and speaks about it and writes about it, people are like, Oh, wow. I'm like, well, hello. <laughs> what a great um, idea. Yeah. What a great idea. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Learn from his books that oak trees support over 400 species of butterflies and moths. And what happens, you see, happen many times when new houses are built. What do they do? The first thing they do is get rid of all those old oh, yeah. trees. Well, and you cut down all the trees, and then they start over and plant other trees, generally non native trees. Right. And that's, you know, People get excited, and I'll be teaching my master gardener things. You look at an oak tree, well, it's got galls, it's got aphids, it's got spider mites, it's mm -hmm. got powdery mildew. Well, those insects that get on, of course, all kind of caterpillars, caterpillars eating the foliage off there. Mm -hmm. Every bird, almost every bird, feeds baby birds caterpillars. And Correct. so if you didn't have those caterpillars eating the foliage off, so if you know it's a native plant that evolved with those caterpillars, it's not going to kill it. I've seen them defoliate in the spring, defoliate in the fall. Uh, and not only... It, are they there and you think, oh, is it good or bad? But you have to realize they're supporting a whole another existence of these birds feeding those things and every baby bird depends on those. And so if you took them out and they didn't have those caterpillars, there's nothing to feed them. If you didn't have a tree, you know, there's birds that nest in trees, there's birds that eat acorns like, like woodpeckers. Um, and so it's this whole big system and you can't just remove those and expect nothing to, to happen and still have your, your favorite little birds. And you can't go around and spray every caterpillar and think you're doing a good thing. And then here's a bird over here who has no caterpillars, or they're picking up a half poisoned caterpillar and feeding it to a baby bird. And so, you know, it's really Rachel Carson. Along the way, people started figuring that out, but we still missed the really big picture because I answer gardening questions every day of my life, and people just freak out because there's worms on a tree or worms on a passion vine or things that they're supposed to be on there. There's supposed to be catalpa worms on a catalpa tree. There's supposed to be um, Gulf Fritillary worms on passion vines. Those things evolve together. They're not going to kill it or they would die with it. And so these things have a much more understandable system than we do. We don't even know what to eat to, to stay alive. They do. And so uh, their system has been worked out a lot longer than ours. So we should really pay attention to, to nature. Nature is the best teacher uh, for life, for gardening, for just about everything if you've got the time to, to be quiet and listen and watch. Yeah, one of the most astonishing things I learned recently, I read research that Dr. Talamy and some other students had done his students and they had gone to they surveyed several home landscapes up in the northeast and they counted the native plants or the plants from other areas and, and evaluated all the landscapes then they counted the birds and what they came up with that to support chickadees you needed to have 70 percent mass native plants in your yard wow that's astonishing so what that tells me save those oak trees when you put your house in that and because the, that's a big mass right there that is the and then uh, of course even beyond that uh, 
chickadees are a secondary cavity dweller, mm -hmm. and so they live in a, a hole, a, a cavity. They can't make their own woodpecker to the only ones that can do that. Woodpeckers are primary cavity dwellers. And so not only do you have to have those oak trees with their caterpillars and with the nuts and, uh, and with the, um, the area in the home for the birds to live in, they actually have to die. Woodpeckers come in there, help control the things that killed it, make holes in there for their own roosting and nesting, and then that's what chickadees and titmice and bluebirds and all these other things lived in. And so there's uh, just the insect part of it is just a little tip of it. And, right. uh, a plant uh, has value from the time it starts to when it's a little bitty thing waiting in there for forest succession for a big tree to die. And then it grows and it supports all this wildlife and creates all this habitat. And then it dies and it still starts a whole nother type of habitat. Right. And then there's fungi and bacteria and things that cause it all to decay. And it turns back into soil. And then the next little tree takes it. So it's just this constant recycle. And somehow, uh, you, know, you can think of like, you know, Asian mentality, understand that, maybe Native American, but not fast moving everyday American now. We just don't think about those sort of things. But that whole cycle is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, to us, to birds, to the air, to the water quality. And uh, so it's a very good time. It's high time that we start paying attention to all those. Mm -hmm. Whether you like a chickadee or not, I'm pretty sure right. most people like oxygen and, and clean water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and doc another thing Dr. Tallamy had said was that we all can make a difference. I mean, we have, you know, you might have a tenth of an acre or hundreds of acres. That, that's a very good point. But you need to take care of yeah, what you have. Um, we're not all Ted Turner, so we can't own millions of acres. So, um, I got married a year or two ago and my mm -hmm. wife she gets frustrated every now and then because I'm off, you know, wandering through the wilderness, you know, tending things. Mm -hmm. She said, well, why do you have to own 50 acres? And I said, because I can't own 50 million acres. <laughs> so this is Texas, so you're not happy to own from the sunrise to the sunset. Right. And so, yeah, naturally, if you own lots of land, you can make a bigger difference. But uh, I have all these family quilts, mostly Depression-era quilts. Matter of fact, my master gardeners are going to have a, we're going to have a garden talk quilt show this, this summer. And so those quilts are made of bits and pieces of shards of material that my relatives and ancestors saved and then pieced them together made something pretty out of them and it was utilitarian to keep warm during the winter time well i think of uh, saving the environment and the, uh, through gardening the same way so everybody's garden it can be a tiny little piece of material or it can be up one block of the quilt or maybe you own the whole quilt it doesn't matter you put all those together and you have an ecosystem in each shard each stitch each block was just important to that quilt. If you took it out of there, people would say, well, there's a hunk missing in the quilt. And so we can do that. And that's our only hope. I mean, there is no going back. Nature will never exist like it did. Uh, but yet we can put it all together by teaching everybody, know the things to do. And so you know, a butterfly and a bee may be going landscape to landscape, but they can still be getting the same. That's another thing. You want the same plant. I mean, one native plant in one person's yard is a sport a little bit, but if you have a neighborhood full and then a, a pasture and woodlands and somebody each person does their part we can make at least some semblance of what used to be here to support those mm -hmm. things and so yeah everybody has a part to play and um, I write a lot about pocket prairies and people are always saying well how big does it have to be I have one that's a quarter acre I actually have one that's you know, five acres more of a prairie itself but you can do it in a square foot a postage stamp prairie you can be in a pot and so you use those same plants but you total it up with everybody else's and you're part of the, uh, the big pocket prairie or the, or the real prairie or the real environment. So yeah, everybody should, not only can play a part, should play a part. Yeah, and one objection I've heard before to native landscapes is they're messy. Is that true? Absolutely, one billion percent no, because <laughs> there's no difference in a native plant and a non-native plant when it comes to messiness or landscape. But they're all plants. Every plant was native somewhere. Mm -hmm. So now you can have bad design mm -hmm. in azalea gardens, in any kind of plant. Design is design. So yeah, you can, and a lot of the original, quote, native plant landscapes and xeriscapes were put in were bad design. And, and if you don't maintain it, well, of course it's gonna be messy. If you don't maintain your lawn, it's gonna be messy. If you don't maintain your vegetable garden. So uh, a native plant is no more messy. You can cultivate it. You can landscape Versailles with native plants if you want to. So it can be as well tinted or non-tinted as you want. So there's no correlation whatsoever between messiness or ugliness or uh, when it comes to native plants because every plant that you see in any landscape was native somewhere it's just a plant and so, uh, so yeah that's just wrong people have 
either they hadn't taken the time to study it or they'd seen somebody that just let their landscape go. Mm -hmm. what, and Lynn Lowry was a wonderful native plant person, but he liked to do what's called fence row landscape. And well, most people don't want a, a landscape that looks like a fence row. So mm -hmm. you can do any landscape design on this planet mm -hmm. with native plants. You can maintain it as much as you want. You can go out there and, you know, tend it with a toothpick and sweep it every 30 <laughs> seconds if you want to. So it doesn't have anything to do with where the plant came from. That's about you and your design style and your level of maintenance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we posted your um, plant list on our Facebook page several months ago, and it is hugely popular. But people need a little direction. What do I buy? Where do I go? But yeah, that, and that's important because a lot of people don't realize the number of the plants in the trade are native here. Mm -hmm. Things like dogwoods and Carolina jasmine, Texas blue bonnets, and the number of perennials like echinacea and things like that. So some things are easy to find, coral mm -hmm. honey, so the things that were already in the trade, uh -huh. uh, and so some other things are harder to find. So the first thing to do is start using the things that we already uh, in the trade that mm -hmm. we can find, and then some of the things are harder to find. I know you'll have a native plant sale. There are other people that can uh, uh, help provide some things. So you start by using the things that we already have. But even before that, you learn to know what's native, what's not, what's from the Americas, what's from, from Asia, what's from the, you know other parts of the world that we shouldn't be growing here, and certainly uh, which plants are invasive uh, that we don't want to use that are causing you know ecological destruction. Now, invasive plants, that's interesting. Because I hear that word sometimes if somebody plants um, Mexican petunias. Oh, they're invasive. Is, are, is that true? Well, yeah. No, well, people don't understand the, what the word is. And so you'll hear it for everything from uh, there are native plants that are very vigorous, like um, uh, trumpet creeper. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really vigorous plant. Um, so just because the plant spreads a lot uh, doesn't mean it's invasive. And so those are what I call vigorous plants. Nature designed some plants to be really vigorous when you have a, a fire or a disaster or a landslide you can't have bare dirt so some plant needs to cover that up or you lose things to erosion and you got heat generated so it's not good to have bare dirt so just because it's vigorous doesn't mean it's invasive invasive plants are those from another continent that spread not just vigorously uh, like a orange daylily in your flower bed or mexican petunia but spread by seed across the country as if they were a, a, a native plant. And so they naturalize ad nauseum. So things like Chinese tallow, uh, Chinese privet, Japanese honeysuckle, those were introduced as ornamental plants mm -hmm. and then spread all across the entire South, uh, entire you know, chunk of the country. And so people now, uh, even people that should know like botanists, uh, there are all these different degrees to where a plant naturalizes. So I was giving a I was writing an article, giving a talk though, and I looked up a particular vine on there. It was listed on the invasive plant site for Texas as being invasive, invasives.org. And I thought, well, that's weird. Never seen one in my life. And that's what I'd, well, I looked on there and it, one plant was found in the wild one time in all of Texas and it made the list. Well, that's not how it works. We're, the invasive plants, you find hundreds and billions of trillions of times. And so like Chinese tallow, I think is the number three most numerous tree in Louisiana now. Those are invasive plants where they spread and take over the entire wilderness, replace entire ecosystems like entire understories, entire fence rows that are Chinese privet. That's when an invasive plant is not one that just irritates you because it fills up your flower bed or, you know, clambers over the wall or even you know, spreads here and there. Like nandinas, I've seen a thousand nandinas in the wild in my life scattering. But those plants have been here the same amount of time is Chinese privet, Japanese honeysuckle, oh, and Chinese talus. And so we're talking about spreading a little bit, so we need, a, uh, we need actually a, a rating, like one through 10, with 10 being doesn't stop till it reaches the coast, mm -hmm. and others, you know, zero, not spreading at all, and there's gonna be everything from one to nine to 10 in there. Right. And so we can't just say you know, it's invasive because I found one, two, 20, or 20 million mm -hmm. when there are mm -hmm. hundred billions of other things out there. Right. So people don't understand what, what invasive is. So it's exotic plants from other countries that take over entire ecosystems by spreading across the entire country. And choke out. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah. To, to, to where they're the only thing existing there. Yeah. And, and the U.S. Forest Service has a good bulletin on that. Yeah, there are people that know, and then there are a lot of, and, and I, I love citizen scientists, and I'm sort of one of those myself, but uh, you always have to pay attention who's saying it. Is it somebody that really knows just because you find something? You know, there are lots of things I thought I knew when I was younger and started and turned out, you know, as dumb as a stick. And so, <laughs> and you'll never know it all, and I'm still learning to this day. And so, that's something really important. Before you declare a plant, invasive you, you need to know 
uh, what it is because that's uh, it's a big issue these mm -hmm. days. But it's good for people to know those that are invasive, they can avoid planting and, yeah. you know, and if, I, if something is really vigorous from another place, I'm a little skeptical whether I want to include yeah. that. Do I want to, I'd rather mm. choose a native myself. None's, it's sad. I mean, I'd rather choose native because they belong here and they support habitat. Plus, it looks like, I mean, I want people to come to East Texas. I can go to China and Japan to look, if I want to see what China and Japan look like, I'd like to come to East Texas and see what East Texas looks like. You know, tall pines and, and dogwoods and southern sugar maples and things that, that literally make us and have for millions of years. So, uh, but a plant from other part of the country uh, doesn't look right here, especially if you have, you know, tree and stuff and they're, they're covered. You know, roadsides in the spring here are mostly plants from Europe. Queen Anne's lace, crimson clover, um, veg, veg, and annual ryegrass are all European annuals, and that's what dominates our roadsides here. So it's like a going down the England right. countryside, and then the landscapes, when you get to a landscape, they're all Asian, and so it just seems weird. you got other continents that we're looking at here. When we had beautiful, there was no place on the planet that people will wrote as many glowing um, letters and diaries than Texas when it came to, to wildflowers and so it's just a shame now that we've choked them out with other things and people don't even know the difference between what's a wildflower, uh, what's native, what's what's not native, right. so, so we That's need to right. learn. That's right. That's right. Yeah, all good stuff, all good stuff. So we need to include natives in our landscape, help take care of the environment. And one more thing I'll mm -hmm. point out, uh, we talked about being messy. Uh, you know, I like neat landscapes, matter of fact I'm a uh, I'm sort of a, a neat freak on the inside and messy on the outside. So I'm a French gardener wrapped up with an English naturalistic <laughs> gardener. But a little bit of messy is not bad. Nature wasn't designed to be perfect. True. And you can't keep everything perfect. And it wasn't that many years ago, I was listening to NPR, and they did a study in England on their native bees, because everybody's had problems with native bees. They compared a messy landscape in England, a moderately messy landscape, and a neat landscape. Well, guess where the majority of the native bees were? In the, mess. In the messy landscape. And so that's, if we keep things too perfect, and too mowed, and too pristine, and we don't have seeds, and flowers, mm -hmm. and pollens, and dead, and live, and all these mixtures that things evolved with. Because, you know, lawnmowers weren't native, mowers weren't native, you know, uh, pastures, grazing, all the things that we think of now when things stay neat, and, and prim, and proper, weren't native. And so, the system wasn't based on a, a mm -hmm. on have a pristine landscape, so best to back off a little bit, and it makes you feel better too, because you'll never keep everything perfect. And sometimes it's best to set back and say it's not supposed to be perfect. Right. Uh, in Asian floral design, they'll put in a dead leaf or a broken stem to mimic nature, and so there's nothing wrong with that because it's not supposed to be perfect. So nobody's perfect, and your landscape shouldn't be either. So. Well, native bees, for instance, need some bare dirt. Absolutely. I mean, you can't mulch everything. They need bare dirt, dirt, they need dead grass, they need uh, right. uh, dead stems, and so nature needs all that. So. Mm -hmm. Good deal. Well, so people can do a lot more, and they can refer to your list. We have a native plant sale in the fall, and we also have a spring sale where we have um, natives included, but in the fall Good. we really concentrate on natives. And I want to mention your books. Um, Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening. I love growing things to eat, and of course there are lots of native things to eat too, so I love grazing out of the wilderness too, so, yeah. and uh, uh, I do like to write, and so I've written, a, I hadn't written a book specifically on native plants, but I did do one on a, a heirloom plants, which oh, include right. a native's and old-fashioned plants. Okay, the heirloom then, gardening uh, yep. with and Dr. Then, uh, Bill Welch. And then Dr. Welch and I most recently did one called the Rose Rustlers on That's antique right. roses, and so I, uh, I did one on landscape design, and so you can do good design with any kind of plant, so people need to know you can certainly do good design with, with native plants just like you can with, with non-native plants. That's an important fact. And I wanted to mention on the fruit and vegetable gardening, um, it's very simple. Every vegetable and fruit has two pages. Yeah, it's a beginner every, book. It's a recipe so, yeah. for everything you need well, to do. I, uh, you know, you can't write the perfect book for everybody. So one man complains, says the worst book you'd ever read. And I said, well, it's for beginners. And so if you want a, uh, an expert book, my uh, major professor in college and the former boss, Sam Cotner, wrote her, yes. uh, an in-depth vegetable book. So I want everybody to, to grow their on food just like I want everybody to appreciate the environment. So, uh, And I particularly feel for those 50% of the people that don't garden because I'm not going to be happy that they do. So this book was really written for uh, right. for beginners, not, not experts. So. But it's a great place to start. Absolutely. And Just I start somewhere. We I, all started in the same place knowing absolutely nothing. So. And I know when I started using this book, I had a lot better results because I was Good. more, you know, yeah, It does deliberate. take a recipe because uh, more deliberate about what I was doing. Vegetables and, and fruits aren't native plants. They're evolved over thousands of years and they actually have a 
you need to do certain things to make them grow because mm -hmm. you don't just walk in the wilderness and find a bell pepper and a, and a tomato. That's so, correct. So doing vegetable gardens and doing native plants are different. So they do need some coaching there. So. And we, we need we need some imported plants. We wouldn't have anything to eat. So that's true. That but true? lots of lots of cool American plants too that, that change the world and edibles too. So well, that's uh, so true. we need so we need not only do we need to appreciate nature, we need to eat healthier too. Which uh, that's cool. trying to do myself. So there you go. Well, thank you so You're much, very welcome. Greg. Thanks very, for having me. Very informative. You still there? How many minutes did we do? I'd have walked off.